very high up here, <laughs> far away. Maybe, maybe it'll be okay later if I get down in there or I won't get a nosebleed. Uh, pray with me, please. Please. Holy Father, we love what we're doing here. We've heard about you. We've learned some about you through the Lord Jesus Christ and the biblical witness that tells us of him. We're thinking of people who are not yet in the Lord Jesus Christ, but are here, perhaps. And they're here because you have been at work with them. They've heard stories. They've heard the gospel. They're being drawn by that uplifted gospel Christ. And they're seriously thinking of committing their lives to you. We're thinking of them in particular at this moment and asking you, because you're eager to do it, so we know we're asking what pleases you. We're asking you to further open their hearts as you opened Lydia's heart that they might indeed make up their mind and definitively give their lives over to you, taking on them the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful that would be. And bless those of us who have immediate influence with them. Give us the sensitivity and the grace and the gentle boldness uh, to speak to them uh, of our Lord. We believe, Holy Father, that it's in your wisdom that the world by wisdom has not known you, but that you, in your wisdom, have purposed that by the preaching of a foolish message, to save them that believe. So, we ask your blessing on them. And we ask your blessing on those of us who are privileged to be in Christ at this moment. We thank you for the good things that you've done for us and with us and the lovely things you're doing in us. And we're deeply grateful for it. Help us to be enriched and Soon when we eat and we drink, help us with joy and assurance to proclaim the meaning of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things and we give you our thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. First, always first, ceaselessly first, the business of the people of God, the New Testament people of God, is to embody and speak the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we tell our friends and our enemies what they should and must do. It's our business to tell them what God did in Christ Jesus so that what we say to them will be gospeling. Mm. It's true. It's true that Paul said in Romans chapter 5, 
He said, for a righteous man, nobody will die. By a righteous man, he means someone upright, solid citizen, but not the warm kind. He said, for a righteous man, nobody will die. He said, for a good man, or a good woman, of course, but for a good man, that's someone who's upright, but warm, appealing. For a good man, some will even dare to die. It's true he said that. But we're not supposed to press it too hard. Because you know people, you know of them. They're, it's happening uh, during wars and all of that. You know that people do give their lives for upright people who are not particularly friendly. You've seen people go to the rescue of absolute strangers. So when Paul says that in Romans 5, all he's doing is laying the groundwork where he can say of the Lord Jesus, but we, we weren't good. We weren't righteous. We were weak and ungodly and yet. Christ died for us. He lays the groundwork to tell us how wonderful the Christ is. But he himself knows, he himself knows that he, Paul, would give more than his life for his own people. For he says in Romans chapter 9, he said, do you know, if I thought Losing my life with Jesus would save some of my people. I could see me wanting to do that. He's following Moses. You remember Moses in chapter 32 of Exodus? God says, I'm going to bury these people and not let them into the land. And Moses said, what? If they don't get in... I don't want to get in either. And these are the people that were breaking his heart, Mark, you. So, so what I'm wanting to say is that people, ordinary humans like you and me, we can want, and we do at times. You may be, be sitting beside one who they don't care who it is. They go to help them in trouble. In this congregation, I'm gathering from the announcements and then our brother's prayer, where he was thanking God for things that you people as a congregation are engaged in. You are obviously involved in doing good, even for people you don't know, and therefore cannot have an emotional connection. The brother who spent 44 years preaching, gone to India all over the place, gone to speak to strangers and that, doing it for people he doesn't know. He's not alone in that. You're like that also. So, so what I'm wanting then to say is this. Should it surprise us that God came looking for us? Should it surprise you that when we screwed the whole thing up at the beginning, our father and our mother said no? We will not maintain integrity with God. When we chose to go our way, should it surprise us that God came looking for us? No, not really. The incarnation should be no surprise at all. In fact, God being God, God being the God we see in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm having a hard time standing behind this. I may end up getting down on the floor. I hope I don't offend anybody, all right? It's too far away. Y yes? Yeah, I saw several nods. So here, here. Look, um, it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us that God came looking for us. We're his children for pity's sake. He made us, even those of us who are not yet Christians, 
We know the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Understand that. But nevertheless, Paul says in Acts 17, we are all his offspring. And so he blesses us with things. And why does he do that? He says. He says he does all of that that we might seek for him. And that we find him. Because he is not far from any of us. The Hebrew writer tells us he's the father of spirits. The book of Luke chapter 1, the last verse, speaks of Adam as the son of God. Eve, his daughter. We are God's children. Even though we're wayward. Even though many of us, multiplied millions of us, are not yet his children in Christ. Nevertheless, we are loved by God. Yes, one of the very favorite passages that just about everybody knows says, For God so loved the Christians. No. The world. God so loved the world that he gave. He's always giving his name. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anybody who believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life because, verse 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Why? Why did, why did he not send his son into the world to condemn the world? Because we didn't need any help with that. But well, we've condemned ourselves well and truly. No, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have oh, life. Wants to narrow us? Wants to cheapen us? Dishonor us? Rob us? Never. Jesus said, I didn't come. The people before me, he's not meaning everyone, but the people before me were thieves and robbers. They killed and cheated. Not me. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Should it surprise us That there was an incarnation. Should it surprise us that God came looking for us? Should it surprise us to hear Jesus say, I came, oh, I came to do the will of my Father in heaven. And one of the expressions of that will was this. I came to seek and save the lost. Hmm. In the Old Testament, in chapter 42 of Isaiah, God is saying the wondrous things he's going to do for Israel in the Messiah. And he says, but Zion, the city, standing for the people, Zion says, the Lord has forgotten me. And God says this. This is Isaiah 42. Listen to this. God said, Can a mother nursing her baby forget that baby? Can a mother forget the child she's brought out of a womb? The answer across the board, I mean, is never. And God says, neither will I forget you. You'll see a loving mother abandon her child before you see me abandon Israel. And Israel has been wicked, mark you. Israel has been evil, as we the human family have been. Israel has been treacherous. They have lacked integrity, didn't keep their covenant with him. And he says to them, You think I'm going to desert you? Never. 
You will prove yourself faithless, but I never will. Paul says that to Timothy, doesn't he? So, no surprise that God came looking for us. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how your life has been a shambles. I know about a shambolic life. I've lived one, God help me. I know what struggles are. Well, that's he's just saying that because he's preaching because he wants to make a point. That's not true. I'm telling you like everyone else. I'm struggling and we're struggling. We're no better or worse than the decent, upright people of the world. Ugh, but we're Christ's, don't you see? And he came gospeling and sang to us in the gospel through Sunday school teachers, fathers and mothers, grandparents, people who got their story from people who got their story, who got their story down to the eyewitnesses who told us and tell us we saw him murdered. We saw him alive and well after they murdered him. We saw the resurrected Lord. We saw him ascend to glory. We experienced him returning to us in and as the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And now dwelling in the body of Christ. He gospeled to us and we came and said yes. And that's what we would love you if you were not yet in the Christ. You, you almost certainly know this. Churches of Christ teach what they construe the New Testament to say very plainly. And will you believe me if I tell you that more and more scholars and more and more churches are beginning to say what churches of Christ have been saying all along and sometimes saying it badly but been saying it all along here's how people become Christians I'm telling you the truth when I tell you that books are now being written saying what we've been saying for a long time which doesn't make us wonderful it just means we were telling what we believe to be the truth and people are now beginning to say this is so Churches of Christ say that when you want to become a Christian, having heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, in trust and repentance, wanting to give your heart to him and have him to be your Lord, that you are baptized in his name, taking his name on you for the remission of your sins. But see, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Baptism, as is the supper, it is a proclamation. For example, we take a trusting, repentant person and we bury that person. If you listen really hard, you won't. You won't. You won't. But if you listen really hard, you'll hear voices shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! You'll hear people jeering. Because when someone is being buried by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the very act, gospeling is being heard. The death, the crucifixion of the sinless Christ is being told again. People jeering. You see visions of Romans bored spickless, gambling for his garments. All of that is going on and being retold, recited, brought to memory again. And then when they come back up, if you listen really hard, you'll hear, you won't, you won't. But if you listen really hard, you'll hear someone saying, oh, are you the gardener? I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And then you'll hear someone say, Good morning, Mary. 
You hear a big rumbling where a stone is being rolled away from the door of the grave, the tomb. You hear angels speaking. All of that happened at the resurrection of Christ. And when someone comes up out of the water again, they, they are gospeling in coming and giving the lives of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is not simply about an individual finding the forgiveness of their sins. It's that. It's bigger than that. It's the announcing of the gospel. It's the retelling, the reciting of the incarnation, the lovely, marvelous life of Christ, that death of His that rescues us and his glorious resurrection, his very much being alive, so that when in churches of Christ when we call people to be baptized, to give themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not simply you have to do this to get forgiveness. That's part of the package. That's not it, though. We're asking them, say, act it on, say, Ah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I trust my life to Him and I here proclaim that He died for our sins, that He rose from the dead, He now lives a mortal, and He's coming back to right all the wrongs. And when they do that, they are Christ's. And they're glad they're Christ. And they're glad as the years go by and you think, yes, Christ is at the center of all my life. That doesn't make us Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful. I'm simply saying it's who we are. We're sinners for pity's sake. We're sad about it. And we're asking His help that we might be the kind of people that reflect Him every day and every way. But here he comes to rescue us from our sins. Not just you and me. Not just us. Them. The world. Call his name Jesus. That text in Matthew 1 has specific reference to Jewish people. But says, call his name Jesus, and then says, all this was fulfilled, all of this, that the scripture might be fulfilled, the virgin will conceive by a son, you will call his name God with us. God couldn't leave us in our trouble. God couldn't leave us in our sinfulness. He had to come. It was inevitable that God, nobody made him. Don't you understand? I know that. You can't be as old as I am and not know that. Nobody forced him to do anything like that. But he wanted to. Haven't you seen? Either in the movies or or a documentary somewhere. Haven't you seen a mother try to shake off the fireman? To get into the burning building because she had a child in there? Is that surprising? Haven't you seen a man jump into a raging river? I saw it. A fellow jumping in to save a dog. The owner. A little dog was in the water. I was going to drown. And this young kid climbed down into the water and saved the thing. People do that. Mothers go to the rescue of their children. Fathers go to the rescue of their children. Parents will work two and three jobs at times. To take care of those who depend on them. You know this. You think we do that and God wouldn't? What? Nobody out loves God. Nobody out suffers God. Nobody out works God. Nobody out pleads God. No. No surprise. God with us. When he made us. When he made us, he said, 
I want one of those. When he made us, he said, I want to be with them. He said that, but he said more than that. He said, I want to be one of them. Yes, I want to be one of them. And we got what? The incarnation. He became one of us. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same. That through dying, he might destroy him that had the power of death and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's 2.14 and 15 of Hebrews. Earlier, he said, of God, he said, it was becoming of God and bringing many children to glory. This is 2.10 and following of Hebrews. And bringing many to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For, here's the piece I'm really interested in. For he who makes us holy and them who are holy are all of one family. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. You and I need to be persuaded. We do. Because you look in the mirror every now and again and you think, good good grief, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to be better, cleaner, purer, stronger, finer? When are you going to really become something that God can look at and say, ah, Love her. Look at huh? Look at him. And, and, and be so pleased with us. And he he does do that. But we look in the mirror and we think, uh, you know, this is terrible. Yeah? God loves you and me relentlessly. Will not back away. Will not give up on us. This, this is the gospel. The gospel is not what you and I should do in response to that. We ought to respond to it. That's our response to something that is already true whether we believe it or not. First, God is who He is. God loves as he loves. God pursues us as he pursues us. That's the first thing. That's the gospel. That's the gospel for you. That's what he would want you. If you walked in the door this minute, among all the other things he might say, he would say, you have the foggiest notion how much I love you. (laughs) You can't get to the bottom of it. Not only would I give you richness of life, not only will I bring you to glory, if you let me, and I'm working at it, whether you want me or not, I'm working to draw you to myself, which is what the Christ meant when he says, and this is John 12, and I, if I be lifted up what I will draw people to me and this it is who it is we worship and this who we're gonna eat and drink abide here and this who we've been singing abide is this what we do every time we pray we end up saying something like in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ the gospel is the good news that we who, the human family, the human family, we who rebelled against God and have been abusing one another down the years and the centuries, dishonoring ourselves and not honoring Him at all, 
living empty lives. That God has come to redeem us, not just in the sense of forgiving us of our sins. He has come in the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem us from empty lives. 1 Peter 2. Knowing this, he says, that you have been redeemed, not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your empty manner of life. That's 1 Peter 2, what? 18 and 19, all right? He said, I came to redeem you from not just your sins, so that you can have forgiveness. I want to give you a life. I want to give you a destiny. I want to give you a mission. I want to give you a place in my service. Let me tell you what I have in mind, he teaches us. I have in mind an ending that you cannot possibly imagine. For I hasn't seen. I'm ignoring the context here for a moment. I hasn't seen. Ear hasn't heard. It never entered the heart, the mind of man. What God has prepared for those that love him. Now some of you are having a hard time physically right now. Emotionally, socially, economically, or whatever it is. And I know that. But for all that, look where you are. You're here. You're singing these songs. You're thanking God. You're going to break bread. You're going to drink the wine. And you're going to be saying thank you for all of these things. Here you are. God bless you for it. Because you have heard a call. Where God says, come to me. I want you to work with me and the body of Christ. I want you to work with me bringing a bio and completing my eternal purpose. And your life now is filled with purpose, even when you're not much in the mood. Yet, here you are. Even when the day is hard, you're working, your boss is an old bat, or, or, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, or something like that, you know, something bad is going on. Even when you're not particularly in the joy-filled mood, you know who you are. You've given your life to him, and you hang on in because you've been called from an empty life of self-serving. Look, I don't want to sign rude. I'm nearly done. Ooh, quarter past eleven. You thought it was one o'clock, didn't you? No, no, I'm, I'm just about finished. Look, um, our, our lives, once more, morally speaking, are no better or worse than the decent people of the world. They love their kids too. They love their husbands and wives, all of that. We have been called peculiarly by the gospel. It's offered to everybody, of course. But we have heard the message and said yes. So we're different. Not Mr. and Mrs. Wonderful. But we're different. Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And your business is to declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You don't look all that different. You eat and drink and dress like everybody else. You marry and you worry about bits and pieces. Nevertheless, you are what God has made you to be. And you are with him working to keep the story alive, the gospel alive. That's who you are. And it's what you're doing. God bless you for it. And you who have not yet given your life to Christ on his terms. You who have loved him for so long. And who have been loved by him even longer. And need to complete your initial obedience to him. We'd love you to do that. What do you think? We would love you to do that. Why don't you think about it while we stand and sing?